um, I guess the moderator uh, is a colleague from DPI, Ben Muller. He is the chief of UN Radio and the News uh, Media Division for the Department of Public Information. So, Ben, I hand uh, the microphone over to you to introduce your panel and take us forward. Many, many thanks, uh, Maher. I expect that transition from the old to the new. And I was just reflecting on that last statement from Rosalie that the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. And, and I think that is one thing that will stick with me when I leave here. People think dreams are just this uh, froth or waffle that you keep up there, but there is a beauty in dreams. I think we can say dreams brought the UN into being. Uh, I am not sure if we are expecting some youth to join us for this panel or uh, if we are all here already. So what I will say again is to, uh, to just say a big welcome to everyone to this second panel um, in this conference room. And I, to repeat what Maha said earlier, uh, that the welcome is not just for those who are gathered here in this room. Uh, from UN webcasts, we are having a lot of people following us. Uh, there are many hashtags for those who are on Twitter, particularly young people. Hashtag UN70 is one of them. Why are we here? What is this second panel about? UNDPI NGO Relations Section is gathering us here for this panel. We celebrate the UN at 70. Uh, specifically for this panel, we are looking into the future. We've had something of the past. Now, for this next hour, we want to look into the future. We want to look at how the United Nations can tap the power of youth all acro across the globe so that we can work better for a better future. How can youth help the United Nations to make not just a difference, but a positive difference? Uh, what vision of the future can we get from our youth and there are many subjects many issues uh, currently the flavor of the month until 2030 uh, we have the sustainable development goals which many simply describe as the global goals what is the role of young people young women young men in making sure that we can achieve these goals by the year 2030 how can young people youth help us to end conflict and promote peace? What about justice? What about development? What about shared prosperity? Uh, we want to make this more interactive uh, to open the floor, but I have three distinguished panelists here to my immediate right, and we will just ask them for two, three minutes to lay out some of their ideas. These are young people who are engaged in endeavors that are in line with this partnership with the UN. Uh, at the far end, wearing spectacles like me, Mohammad Bakrieba, that's correct, youth representative for Call of Culture and International Association for the Advancement of Innovative Approaches to Challenges. Welcome. So what we will do, we'll just take a couple of comments and then we will open the floor, the ideas that are expressed looking into the future uh, 70 years from now, how should the United Nations look? Uh, maybe you are the dreamers whose beauty in dreams can lead us to a better tomorrow. Uh, Muhammad Bakriaba. Uh, we need to trust the youth more. That seems to be, we, we don't need to give them a dose of inspiration. They care enough. We just need to trust them more. But let's hear your views for two, three minutes. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I come from, from, the, from the Middle East, from Saudi Arabia particularly. And um, the, the situation, as all of you uh, know, in, in the region is, is really in a bad um, situation right now and due to, you know, political and, and, and conflict. Um, I think the youth um, have a great role. They already started four years ago in the uh, Arab Spring, and uh, they were keen to have more active role in the, in the countries. Um, uh, some countries have, have learned uh, to open doors for youth, uh, talking about the, the Middle East generally. Um, however, to, for the United Nations to have the youth, uh, General Assembly, uh, the Secretary General envoy on youth, 
um, and to open doors and engage the governments to um, give more representation for youth, to, cap to increase the capacity of, of youth, um, is, ver is something that um, shaped, I would say, in a, in, in a way, the region, the policies in the region. Um, of course, there's a lot to be done uh, when it comes uh, to conflict uh, in the region. Um, the youth can play a very important role, as you say, uh, Victoria, uh, information technology, and um, the, the activeness that the youth have, the dreams that we all uh, have to, um, how the future we want to see, how, how the future we want to create for our uh, generations to come. Um, I think um, opening gate, having more trust uh, into the youth, um, put the youth into positions to make decisions. Uh, and and uh, we're very happy to see like uh, now youth in, in Canada are taking, uh, taking uh, leads. Um, uh, we want to see, I want to talk from, from my perspective from, from the Middle East, uh, we want to engage more youth in decision-making process. We want to have more youth um, capable to lead organizations. Um, I think the United Nations um, should work more with the member states, uh, hidden from member states, uh, to make this a reality. Um, I think also it's very important to utilize social media uh, and information technology, as Victoria said, to advance the engagement of youth um, uh, in a way that um, we can change um, conflicts, we can um, bridge our um, cultures and, and uh, have more peaceful world uh, and more developed world um, globally. Thank you very much. Shukran, Shukran Jazil and Muhammad. Um, again, the issue of trust, more trust. Uh, should we have a young person become the next Secretary General of the United Nations? Can we trust a young woman, a young man of your caliber to take over the reins of the United Nations? I think that's a question we can all discuss around the table later on. I see a hand coming up already. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you look around the room, uh, it would make you feel like having me do a mea culpa because here we are talking about young people and I think there are, if I can be sarcastic, more young people here uh, than maybe those of us who are green and maybe losing our hair even. What I'm trying to say is I expected to see more young men and your young women around the table. So if you don't see them, here's a little game we will have to play for the next 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, if you are older than, let's say, 40, you are going to imagine you are 20 or 22. And if there is any piece of advice you could give any young person watching us on webcast and say, I wish I could be back to 2022. These are the things I can tell you you must definitely do to make the UN and the world a better place. So we're going to open the floor. Uh, they say age is just a number. Just imagine you are in your 20s, you're a young woman and you're a young man and you want to see the world a better place and uh, just make your contribution. I see one hand up. Uh, we will look at other hands. If you want to make a comment, you want to make a recommendation to your young grandchild or your young nephew or niece, they will be watching this. Uh, but one thing uh, I would like to say before we go on, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the UN has come a long way because just in 2013, for the first time in UN history, the Secretary General decided to appoint an envoy for youth, uh, Mr. Ahmad Al-Handawi, uh, because the UN values the input of youth and increasing trust. We now have the United Nations Secretary General's envoy for youth who is trying to do a lot more. He has a website, he's engaging, traveling, and we need to take note of that as well. Um, there is a Twitter question coming, but gentlemen, uh, with the hand up, we will hear from you. You can direct the question or a comment to any of the panelists, um, and then we move on from there. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Libin, uh, you can tell us um, 
from your organization's presence 70 years ago moving forward. We want to focus on the future. A United Nations, 70 more years from now, what can the youth do now to make it a better organization and a better world? Before we go to Mr. Maher Nasser. Very quickly, service. Um, you need to serve your community. One of our, our founder's lines, Melvin Jones, said you can never go far in life until you serve someone else. The youth of today, by getting involved, by acting locally and thinking globally, really are making a difference in helping change the world, refocus it, and my advice to them is keep going. Be active, be part of that change. Serve your communities, and through it, you'll be changing the world. And, and as a personal note, if the three here are representatives of our youth and our future coming, we're in great hands. Thank you so much. Uh, quickly, Mohammed, acting locally, thinking globally, and service. Are there obstacles you see? Uh, Shamista and Victoria, he's spoken well, everybody agrees, service is important, global thinking, local action. What obstacles do you see that will probably not enable you to play these roles the way he has described? Actually, I, th I think there's no obstacle. Um, youth already started doing that. We had an organization um, called Globical, and it's uh, the, the idea of it, of how we can engage youth to um, think globally and act locally. So um, people are working on it. And, and the interesting thing is that youth, through social media, through technology, were able to, um, to mobilize different youth to work on the foot of the United Nations for the MDGs um, in, in 86 countries. So there is no obstacles. It's all what we have to do is, is just to pay the time to make this thing happen. So, and, and the youth are actually doing this. We just need to focus on them, give them more chance, open the window, and let them thrive. Is funding a, a challenge sometimes? You want to travel somewhere, organize groups, is, can funding uh, be a I challenge? don't, you know, funding is always an issue. You cannot do things without money, unfortunately. But, you know, technology has opened doors for, you know, online conferencing. You can, you can do an online meeting to finish things up. Uh, Shamista and Victor will come to you, but let's hear from Nasser. But hold your thoughts, please. Thank Mr. Mahan Nasser. Thank you. I think when you spoke about tools and mentioned that the young generations and youth today have more tools than, than any of the previous generations had, I'm, I wasn't only referring to technology and social media. I'm also referring to a very important fact, numbers. Now we have the highest number the youth has ever, this planet has ever seen. 1.8 billion young people live on the planet today out of 7 billion. And in a world where more organizations and more governments are tending to be democratic and therefore the voice of the majority and people participating in those processes have a bigger say than in the past. How much are youth actually using that as a tool? We heard from members of the three organizations that throughout the past they have acted by contacting their members of Congress or senators and arguing for causes that were close to their heart. Now the tools that in addition to the numbers to actual making an effective change in government that you can have you can also use social media tools, this is again what you have mentioned, to influence those in government to basically adopt the correct policies and to involve young people in taking decisions that affect them. Most government, the 1995, the World Youth Action, the Action Agenda on Youth was adopted in 1995 and still many governments do not or do not have a clear youth policy. This is why I think the, ti the timeliness that you mentioned, Ahmed Hindawi, the Secretary General's uh, envoy on youth that was appointed and he's been acting, working tirelessly to create a forum, a youth forum to basically gather the momentum to uh, ensure that governments are incorporating youth policies that are not only addressing youth but also involving youth in making them. In many governments you'll find that the Ministry of Sport is also the Ministry of Youth. Like as if we just give them sports to play with things and then they will not care about government and not care about opinion and so on and so forth. Historically, uh, the U organization, if you're looking at the success of the UN in one issue, I think 
I know I still, we still have a long way to go in gender in, uh, equity and empowerment of women, but I think the women's issue, if it hasn't been for the UN and for the work, the tireless work of women's groups within member states through the UN and with the UN, we wouldn't be where we are today where we, we have more progress today in, in bringing women to, to the decision-making process, even the Security Council Resolution 1325. Because once a woman, you're always a woman, and you have a women's group that works for women, they continue. But once youth, after a few more years, you know, you're no longer youth. You can be youthful at heart. So there's like, the threat leadership moves on. And once an older person, you're always an older person. So then you have a more consistent, the same group. But I think any cause that has a really uh, dedicated and committed and the same person, the voice is, needs to be the same. But this is the problem with youth. And I think this is where uh, the youth organizations need to find, find a way to come over and this, this maybe problem. Okay. <laughs> but I think it's, it's something that you need to work with. And I think uh, Ahmed is creating a youth platform, a global youth platform, that will be able to harness all that energy, all these ideas from all around the world. 1.8 billion people, we need to tap into that power and look at youth as a resource, as a opportunity, not as a threat, where unfortunately, when you think about people, you mentioned the Middle East and what's happening, many concerns about young people. Young people are the fodder of war, whether they are soldiers, whether they are terrorists, whether they are attracted by ISIS or others, but at the same time, these are the minority. The majority are coming up with new ideas, with new inventions, with things that have made life very complicated. Smartphones, I think, make make us less smart because we rely on them much more and we don't think the same way. Thank you. Thank you, Maha Nassad, Director in the Outreach Division of DPI. Uh, we come back to you, Shamista and uh, Victoria, on these points of youth and the contributions made, brief interventions, and we'll take a few more comments before our time is up. Victoria, maybe you first. Uh, thank you. So the question was, um, what might be the obstacles um, that prevent youth from uh, service to, uh, from service basically. I think, um, I, I absolutely agree with uh, the point that Mohammed made, but I think um, many times uh, the obstacle is actually psychological because um, uh, a lot of times we're talking globally and that's why um, it's difficult to see the long-term influence of local actions on global processes, especially when we're talking about uh, youth, young people that, especially in developing countries, remain marginalized from the global economy and lack the capabilities to access the opportunities that the globalization provides us with. So uh, the way that I suggest uh, of breaching this uh, psychological obstacle is of um, guiding young people through the path that would connect their local actions to uh, global processes. And this is why uh, we highly appreciate your comment, comment, Madam, about intergenerational solidarity, because it is your contribution that would guide us. It is, we're talking the, not only about knowledge transfer, we're talking about wisdom transfer here. And this will help us deal with this obstacle that we have. Wisdom, that's a very important point. Wisdom transfer versus knowledge transfer. Uh, somebody could break that down later, but Shamista. Uh, as you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking of a few countries where the heads of state uh, may be so far up in terms of age. And I'm wondering whether they couldn't have groomed and prepared younger uh, and then there are nations where Canada has just uh, voted in a... a young okay. So you know where I'm going. But Shamista, you take it away and then we will open the floor. Um, I like the idea of not only, you know, acting locally, thinking globally, but thinking locally and acting globally. I think oftentimes it's pretty overwhelming for a young person to think, okay, I have to, you know, end poverty by 2030 on a macro scale. And I think that's really overwhelming, and I think it is psychological. So I like the idea of peer-to-peer -peer sharing, um, thinking about the ideas in the framework of your community. And I think the organization that I represent, we've really thought about scaling up solutions to 
bigger issues. So for example, with our community driven education model, we really taken ideas from a very small sample of, you know, the population outside of Siem Reap, maybe the village of Iran, and we've maybe looked at primary education and we've sort of cultivated communities to think that education is important to believe in empowering their children. And then we replicated that model across many different schools around Siem Reap. So oftentimes it's encouraging you to realize that yes, they're able to impact on a larger scale, but that's a lot. Our world is very large and there and I think um, um, it was mentioned before that there are a lot of young people. So the idea of just tapping into the people around you in your immediate circle and then scaling up is pretty impactful. Thanks. If I get it right, test it locally and then expand from there and then it will become global. Okay. Uh, any other contributions from? Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, as the Queen Mother, and I've been involved with young people for about 50 years as an elder, and I'm glad that our elder talked about intergenerational. How, I want to hear from the young people to tell me how I deal with this, where young people are constantly in the process of growing. As my colleague said, today they're young people, tomorrow they're the middle age and next they're elders, part of that stability. How do we work through one moment you all want to be real grown and you know everything and nobody can tell you nothing, okay? And then once you're given that responsibility that we hand it over to you, then you retreat that you're overwhelmed and then don't know what to do. How would you expect us to balance off the intergenerational relationship with you based on trust? How do we do that? Thank you. You, you get the idea. They want to trust you. They work hard, but in her experience, when it's handed over, uh, people get overwhelmed. Should they still be guiding you from behind? What would be the best mix? to make this a successful model? Mohammed. I, I think this is culture. And, 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 and in every different culture, but internationally, yes, this is a problem with the youth that they need trust. And once they get the trust uh, and they commit actions, and then, you know what, we're not responsible. So they go back to their mother or, or like uh, the elders and try to find solutions. <laughs> uh, I don't do that. <laughs> uh, but. It, it is, it is, it's really um, a matter of you're, you, you needed this, now you hold accountable. You have to commit. You, you, need, you cannot stop guiding them, giving them directions, because you have to um, help them to choose what's correct, what's right. But at the same time, give them the trust to the end. If they commit a problem, this is your, your choice you made, and now I'll give you some tips. You have to flaw, you have to make it yourself. I think this is the, the, the most important thing, that we have to give the trust to the end. The youth should be allowed to make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. Okay, and be guided by those entrusting certain yeah. elements of, okay. Um, you want to add one or two points, and then we, I, I want to see a few hands uh, over there, and, but let's go. To, in fact, those joining us on Twitter, I've just got a Twitter question here. Hashtag UN70, UN70, hashtag UN70. Question from Twitter, Twitter. Alan Williams in Virginia uh, is asking, how can the United Nations and the NGOs work better to promote freedom of religion in the Middle East? Uh, this, this is a big one. Uh, <laughs> how can the UN, we are going to declare world peace somewhere very critical, how can the United Nations and NGOs work better to promote freedom of religion in the Middle East? Um, Muhammad, it seems this, you, you, you have, I may have to go to my big director on the left, but maybe you, I see you have one or two ideas on how the UN and NGOs can work in the promotion of uh, freedom of religion in the Middle East. Um, 
Maha, you may have to give us one or two points as having lived in the region and worked in the region, maybe give us, but Muhammad, from your point of view, how can the UN and NGOs work for the promotion of freedom of religion in the that, Middle East? Th that's indeed a big question. Mm. Um, well, I think, um, you know, unfortunately the media have been um, escalating the issue of religion freedom or religion dialogue in the Middle East quite, for quite a long time. Uh, I think uh, if, we, if we look historically, um, people in the Middle East were living from, you know, Jews, Christians, and Muslims were living uh, peacefully for, for decades. Um, I think the, uh, the United Nations uh, and NGOs would, um, would work more into uh, building peace and understanding through religion. You know, we don't want to have, we don't want to position religion as a drive for conflict. We want to derive peace through religion. Because if you look into all the three religions in the Middle East, the main religions in the Middle East, um, they're all the same. I mean, there's a they're lot of similarities. Yeah, they're all from Abraham. They're all Abrahamic. So why are we making conflicts? Maha. Uh, thank you for that. And I, I mean, it, it's actually time to, to wrap up, maybe, okay. because we have, we have the room until 1 o'clock. So okay. this is the... the Maybe I'll make concluding remarks. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on this issue. In but that I, case, let me take the two people there quickly. But uh, otherwise, so give them a minute each, a gentleman, and then lady at the back. who have deep and professional knowledge and who are prestigious enough to convince people to follow them. And normally, young people, we are not among those people. And once we meet these qualifications, we are not young people anymore. So <laughs> I want to ask you, how would you address this dilemma we have been facing and we, we still face in our future? Thank you. Have one word each. Experience, accomplishment, achievement versus trust, to give to the youth one second. Let's have the second lady there. Hold on to that. Quickly, uh, we are about to wrap up, but you can. So, um, just a little bit of 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 a little bit working hand in hand so that youth and experience can learn from each other. Okay. So, Victoria, uh, the two questions, give quick practical examples, maybe point by point quickly, and we go through the three of you. Victoria first. Uh, I will begin with the second question, if I may. Uh, practical examples. You have 30 uh, I, seconds. Okay. So uh, one example on the state level is uh, states can implement UN delegates programs and uh, send their young representatives to uh, UN headquarters or any other UN office to see how decision uh, making happens and then go back home and implement those uh, practices there. Uh, on the UN level, we are uh, surrounded by wonderful DPI interns here. And this is one very practical example of how the UN can um, benefit from all the knowledge and skills that More the youth internships. provide. Oh, yes. Okay, Shamista. For me, it's about conversations. On any given week in Washington, D.C., I've been able to walk into the World Bank or the IMF, attend an event, talk to someone sitting next to me who, you know, might be head of a division or might even just be interning there. So I think, yeah, it is about giving access, but it's about making this knowledge available, having that RSVP link, you know, circulated on the right list. So we're talking about technological transfer. Thank, Thank you. you. Mohammed, last word before we go to 
Mr. Mahanasa. I think accessibility of information is, is very vital. Uh, I would like to address a country like Italy, where we're being able to uh, give a good drive for the youth to represent their countries globally. We have the youngest 25 years old Congresswoman, um, or empowerment, uh, Berlin woman uh, in, 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 in Italy. We have, in, in my hometown, only 30 years old young lady is representing, is an ambassador. So this is like something that we want to see and as an example in other countries. Okay, on that note, I've grown 10 years younger here, and I'm going to hand over to my director, Mr. Mahanasa, to close us. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ben, and thank you all for this very interesting discussion. Just to touch the question on Twitter, I don't think the issue in the Middle East or anywhere else is about the freedom of religion. Conflicts are mostly about power and the distribution of economic resources. Religion is often used as an excuse to gather supporters or to create some kind of justification, but it's always about power and the distribution of economic resources. And I think, as Kofi Annan said in 2006, at the time when there was a crisis of what is known, became known as the cartoon crisis, the, in his, one of his most quoted uh, statements, is basically he said, the problem is not in the faith, it's in the faithful. It's in how people interpret the faith in, and using basically certain segments and elements to either amplify an inherent purpose that they have and, and, and basically hijack a religion or a group of whatever people believe is in, in that religion. So I think we have to be very careful in terms of what, what is the nature of that conflict. It's not about religion. It's about basically power and economic distribution of economic resources, and that's where we have to make sure we, we touch it. I haven't finished yet. <laughs> it's okay. I would like to make basically again, once again, just to conclude the remarks, to thank everybody for coming for this briefing to celebrate the UN's 70th anniversary. Uh, we hope that, of course, you'll continue to celebrate in your own NGOs and around the world to commemorate the support and celebrating the UN, not just for the UN being the UN, but for basically highlighting what we have done, but also, again, learning from the mistakes or the challenges that we have uh, not been able to overcome uh, over the last years and maybe achieve them in the future. I would like to thank our special partners in this briefing, the exec NGO Executive Committee, and of course now I would like to recognize and, and uh, announce the new chair of the NGO Executive Committee, for those of you who haven't met him, and, uh, Bruce Knotts. And we look forward to uh, working with him and the committee, of course. I mentioned the last briefing that we have confirmation from uh, the Republic of Korea that they will be hosting the NGO DPI conference. Now they have confirmed the date on which they can host the conference, and we are going to be working with them very closely on those. Uh, the dates are 30 May, 31st May, and 1st of June. Uh, and it's very close, I know, so that's why we're going to have to really speed up the work in the preparations. And, and now I mentioned already the 250 uh, iconic building landmarks that will be going blue. We are using the hashtag UNBlue to capture that moment. So if you are on Twitter, you can actually look and see some of those images coming through uh, directly. And, and I think there was a flyer in your kit that you have received. Uh, we invite you to continue the celebration with following the NGO-led afternoon entitled, event entitled Looking Ahead from the UN at 70 celebrate and build together with our future leaders. Uh, it will take place across the street at the lower ground floor meeting hall at the family school from 2.15 to 2.4.30. And I think there's an announcement about that. If it may, would, yeah. yeah, Richard. Uh, just, uh, first of all, I would like to Maybe to come uh, to the microphone. Uh, on behalf of the community, I would like to thank uh, uh, our wonderful moderators and panelists. Really, they did an extraordinary job. They deserve another round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> and for the audience, both those in the room and those who could not get in the room, uh, first of all, thanks for coming. And please do go across the street at 215. It will be a very participatory uh, activity, certainly for all of us who are very young at heart. Uh, from Rosa on along, and our, our wonderful birthday girl who celebrates her birthday with us every day. Uh, so please do come across to the family school at 2.15. Uh, wonderful uh, young people and people of all ages, music, art, participate, uh, opportunities to make your own vision of UN at 70. Everybody who comes can take away their own version of UN at 70. It's a, a wonderful opportunity, so please do come. Thank you very much. Thank you.
And, and I think with that, I would like to f extend one final word of thanks to the DPI NGO team for organizing this. Yeah. And of course, the interns. Cannot forget them. And, and Ben, thank you for being with us. Thank you all.